very interesting morning. I'm pretty sure that only myself and the Lord knew, knew in advance what I was going to speak on this morning. Um, but you'd think that the song leader was looking over my shoulder as I prepared this week. We're, we weren't in cahoots. We didn't, we didn't consult. Uh, but so many of the songs that, that he selected really prepared our minds for the message and vice versa. And I love when God does that. You know, you've heard a lot in the news about the heat wave this summer. We really haven't experienced it so much here, thankfully, but parts of the country are baking and we've had some hot days, but really pretty typical summer. Um, one of the, the hottest days we had was probably uh, right around the 4th of July and, and uh, our AC at home uh, picked that day to not be working. Bad day because we had, I don't know, about 20 people in the house that day and some of you were those people and it was cooler outside in the sun than it was inside in the house. And uh, we, oh, we suffered. Came to find out that what caused the problem in our air conditioner was a bug. Not an electronic bug, a bug. I hate bugs. <laughs> and so it was an easy fix, but boy, it gave us grief for a few days. And maybe you've experienced that with a, th those things go down never at convenient times. Maybe uh, a car or a house or, or whatever. We've even had a couple of units here at the building that, that have been non-functional this summer. Do you ever wonder how grandma and grandpa survived without air conditioning? Now, not just in their car, but in their house and every place they went, how did they make it through a hot summer? Well, I guess if you think about it, they didn't. They're all dead. <laughs> and so that's, that's what people did before air conditioning. They just died. <laughs> that's my perspective on it, at least. We're, we're pretty spoiled, aren't we? We really are. Uh, we moderns. We can get pretty discour discouraged, disturbed if any of our conveniences are taken away. Today, I want us to think, though, about another kind of conditioning that perhaps we rely on a lot less than Grandma and Grandpa did, and certainly a lot less than our Lord did. We might ask ourselves this morning this question, which do we desire more? Modern conveniences or prayer conditioning? I'd suggest today that if we had to, we could do without air conditioning and, and a lot of things, a lot of money and, and other modern necessities, if we were more reliant if we were more dependent on prayer, prayer conditioning, if you will. There was and is one who relied on prayer more than any other of all time, past or future, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. As breathing is to us, so prayer was to him. It was natural, it was regular, it was done in times of great joy, but also in times of great sorrow. And it was done in routine, everyday times, as was his custom, the Bible says, of Jesus' prayer time. So his was a well-rounded prayer life and really a great example for us as we learn to pray. You know, the disciples came to him one time with the request, Lord, teach us to pray. 
and he did. And that really ought to be our request as well of the Lord. I want to do a little word association with you for a moment. I'll say a word and you take note of the first thought or two that comes to your mind when you hear it. Here we go. Here's the word. Gethsemane. If you're familiar with the, the gospel accounts of, um, of this word, there ought to be some pretty concrete images that come to mind in association. And when I think of Gethsemane, I think of darkness. I think of anguish, of sleepy disciples, of a kiss of betrayal, of sweat drops like blood, of the flash of an angry disciple's sword, and of the healing touch of the great physician. All these come to mind when, when I hear Gethsemane. But more than any of them, you know, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John carefully on this word, and if you were commissioned to paint a picture of Gethsemane, I guess you would have to depict Jesus on his knees in prayer before God. That's Gethsemane prayer. Let's try to learn from this scene today. Matthew chapter 26. I'd like us to read the account that Matthew gives of this. You can learn something about Gethsemane from each gospel writer, but let's do Matthew chapter 26 beginning at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So Gethsemane. It is a, it's a dramatic scene. It's a dark and foreboding one but one in which we learn much about our Savior. Remember the situation. Jesus and his followers had recently come to Jerusalem for the great Passover festival. Thousands were in town for this, just like a, a big busy convention that we would see in a city today. Jesus knew though that it wasn't just another Passover. In fact, at this Passover, he was to be the lamb that would be sacrificed. And so Jesus spends the night teaching and preparing his disciples and praying with them and praying for them. And a lot of that you can read in the account that John gives us in his gospel. 
He sets up what we call the Lord's Supper, which we have partaken of this morning. He predicts who his betrayer will be. And he even cools Peter's sails a little by telling him that he would deny Jesus three times. Well, there's a lot that happened that night. And as it got late, this weary group of disciples and their troubled master walk out of the city of Jerusalem into the cool night air. They walk down and through the valley of Kidron. Then they walk up the Mount of Olives, a place they were familiar with. Some great things had happened on that mount. But this night, the Lord's attitude was different. He wasn't gearing up to preach a great sermon. He wasn't preparing to heal the sick. Because now he seemed crushed, forsaken, deeply troubled. The word Gethsemane, by the way, means an olive press. There's a cave on the Mount of Olives where archaeologists have discovered an ancient olive press dating to the time of Jesus. The garden is full of olive trees. Olives were, were plucked from them and, and they were taken to a place like this where there was a press and they were put in that press and those olives were, were crushed there. And the oil squeezed out of them and collected for use in various applications, lamps and other things. Maybe it was this cave in this particular spot in Gethsemane where Jesus and his followers gathered. Maybe it was here Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed. I believe that all the prayers of Jesus' life prepared him for these three prayers in Gethsemane. All the routine, customary prayers, all the mealtime prayers, all the prayers of joy and thanksgiving, all the prayers he made for others prepared or conditioned him for the prayers of Gethsemane for this moment in his life. Folks, we need to learn this. Prepare yourself to pray in difficult, crushing times by praying throughout your life. Don't wait until your own personal Gethsemane comes along and then try to figure it out. You know, Isaiah, the great prophet, especially of the Messiah, prophesied long ago in the 53rd chapter of that prophecy that the Messiah would be crushed, he said. He would be crushed. I think that might point toward Gethsemane, which was well known as a place of crushing, where Jesus would face his most difficult moments, I believe. Jesus in Gethsemane is struggling with God's will for him. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever struggled with God's will for you? Do you ever wonder, why, Lord? Why this way? Why does it have to happen this way? Can't it happen some other way? Why not another way, Lord? Do you know that prayer? Do you know those thoughts inside? Jesus shows here that it's okay to ask those questions when you're going through it. It's okay because, you know, it's possible to change the mind of God through prayer. That's a pretty powerful thing. If, if Jesus didn't believe this, what did he pray for? At least in the first prayer, he... he uh, that Matthew records here, he's trying to change God's plan a bit, isn't he? Verse 39, once again, my father, 
if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Yes, Jesus says, your will be done, Father. But he also says, let this cup pass from me. The Old Testament prophets, when they spoke of a cup, they were always referring to a cup full of God's wrath. It was a, a metaphor. Jesus knew he was about to drink that cup, the cup of the wrath of God, the cup of God's anger against the sin of mankind of all ages, your sin and my sin. Jesus was about to bear God's wrath for all those sins in his body on the cross. That's why he was crushed in Gethsemane. His sinless, pure soul recoiled from drinking such a cup. And so he prayed. He asked if it would be possible to have this removed. If God could change his plan and do it some other way. So this first prayer, to me, is, is the most agonizing. It was so difficult, notice, he had brought his friends with him. Jesus, who had emphasized a lot of times in his teaching the importance of private prayer, right? Go into your closet and that kind of thing. But on this occasion, even he needed friends to pray with him, to be physically with him as he prayed. Folks, one of the greatest things we can do as a body of believers here in this place is to be comfortable and trusting enough with each other to pray with each other in times like these. Not just in worship on Sunday morning or when we assemble to, to study the Bible together, that's great, but not just in those times, which can be sort of formal. But I'm talking about in each other's homes, at the hospital, at the cemetery, in the aisles of, and the, the hallways of this building, wherever it's needed, whenever times of crushing come, Jesus needed those together times of prayer. So do we. Let's promote it. However, don't forget Jesus' prayer partners let him down, didn't they? After an exhausting day and night, they fell asleep. So finding no comfort with people... Jesus turns solely to the Father. He turns to God and he prays again. This time in Matthew's account, the prayer changes ever so slightly. I think there's a lesson in that for us as well. Verse 42, prayer number two, my Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Notice the difference in language between the first and and second prayer, there's, there's a bit of a change, isn't there? It seems, uh, it seems calmer. It seems less organized, uh, agonized, less, less crushing, more reasoned here. It appears that Jesus is coming to realize that there's no other way for God's will to be accomplished than drinking this cup. To its dregs. Now I'm sure that part of Jesus already knew that, right? Spiritually, intellectually, but you see, Gethsemane wasn't a schoolroom or a lecture hall. It was a place where the humanity of Jesus was plainly struggling with the divine will. What Jesus knew intellectually he struggled with practically and we're the same way so how does Jesus 
deal with this tension that we all face at times. He does what he was conditioned to do. What he had conditioned himself to do, he prays. And those prayers, as tense and crushing as they were, confirmed in him without a doubt the Father's will, and he followed it. Several years later, one of the followers of Jesus would pen these words, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, where it's written, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So the Lord, after this second prayer, goes back and finds his friends sleeping again. This time he doesn't say anything, but simply go, turns to go and pray a third time. Notice the exact same words. You see, now he's relying totally on the Father. And in this very trying time, he simply repeats the same words. Now, in this instance, God didn't change his mind, did he? Did Jesus' prayers fail? Of course not. Notice what these prayers did for the Lord. They brought him into complete alignment with the Father's will. We've seen that. They comforted him. Jesus, if you think about it, what happens from this point, when he goes through all the torture and, and goes through the cross, he doesn't make a spectacle of himself. You know, in the trials, or even while he's hanging on the cross, rather he is calm. How can you be calm when you're being tortured? If you're prepared. He is calm he is peaceful. His demeanor made a pagan Roman soldier say, surely this was the Son of God. Because that soldier had seen men crucified before, and he knew what they normally did, hurling curses, screaming at the heavens. Jesus endured it in silence. Like a lamb before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So these prayers strengthened him and they prepared him. Jesus was conditioned by prayer. No, God didn't take the, the cup away from him, but he did prepare the drinker. John chapter 18, verse 11. Remember, after Peter had taken a sword and tried to take someone's head off, Jesus rebuked him and he said, put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that I, the Father has given me? You see how now his will is perfectly in line with the Father. Have you ever wondered why sometimes you just fall apart at situations much less distressing than Gethsemane or the, the cross, much less crushing than things like that, than that, that Jesus faced in Gethsemane, why sometimes that just wrecks us. It isn't just because he was Jesus and you're not. It's because we don't pray like he prayed. We're not conditioned like he was. We're not prayer conditioned. It was in times of crisis and trial that Jesus was most fully revealed as God's son by the response he made to those things. You take a sponge, 
in your hand and squeeze it and you'll know what's in it. You'll know if it's empty. You'll know if it's full of water. You crush that sponge and you'll know what's inside. The same is true with us. Same was true with Jesus. Look at what happened when he was crushed. Look at what came out. Father, forgive them. What about you and me? It's in those times like Gethsemane that our status as disciples of Christ will be most fully revealed. I'm just asking you this morning, are you ready for those times? Are you daily conditioning yourself for the tougher times that are to come? They're coming, folks. Are you, are you conditioning yourself for it? You know, superstars are made in the preseason, in the training. Strong Christians are developed through a lifetime of prayer. I just ask you to meditate on that today. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, thank you for this day. We pray you've been glorified. Help us, teach us to pray. And thank you for the example of your Son, our Savior. And today, Father, if we need to make a response to him, if we need to give our lives to him in obedience or to come back to him in repentance, we ask for your courage to step out. Thank you for your love in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come this morning, we offer you this time a response. Let us stand. Let us sing.